this episode, futurist and Donnie of the fourth industrial revolution, Eric Pylon, Big Nell, and I came up with a few sketch ideas. Oh, I just made this super intelligent computer that can outthink everything. Whoops, what do we do now? Uh, a discussion about blockchain, but like complete nonsense. The blockchain law drama, where there's no drama. Like, which one did we pick? You'll find out on this episode of... It's a sketch comedy podcast show. Welcome to Sketch Comedy Podcast Show, the one-of-a-kind show where I, Stuart Rice, invite interesting people to have intriguing conversations and then improvise a comedy sketch based on what we talked about. It's the only show like it on the internet. Between the emergence of ChatGPT, Google's upcoming AI thing, and Microsoft's vaguely evil Bing, the world is definitely on the precipice of huge change. If you've tried these tools, well, you know. In fact, how do you know that any of the things that I'm saying right now aren't just part of the script that the hive mind came up with? It's getting scary and confusing, isn't it? Good thing we have people like this episode's guest, Eric Pylon Bignell. Eric is a futurist who wrote a best-selling book called Surfing Rogue Waves, which I've read and is fantastic. Uh, and it's a great guide that gives you everything that's going on with the world. Like all the new technologies and new changes. Blockchain, it's in there. You know, AI, yeah. What's for dinner? Nah, you still got to come up with that. For now, there's going to be an algorithm, I'm sure. But Eric's book and Eric himself is actually going to help us like smoothly go into this brand new era that's going to show up. An era that honestly I'm very excited about because I know a lot of people talk about people losing jobs, but uh, it's kind of my hope is that we don't have to have a lot of crummy jobs. I mean, think of all of those fortunate writers at uh, all of those crappy websites with the list, the listicles that don't have to do that anymore. It's great. Maybe they can actually start writing real stuff. Anyway, without any further ado, my conversation with Eric Pylon Big Nell. Hey, Eric. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. I've got a question for you real quick. What makes you interesting? Ha. Huh. I guess that depends who you ask. Oh, I asked you this time. That's true. You did. Yeah, that, that, that is a good question. I'm not sure what makes me interesting. I almost feel like asking you what makes you interesting, but I'm sure you've probably got that a few times. Um, <laughs> I have. It's a, it's a good stall technique. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so now that I'm done stalling, um, I, I guess there's a, a few things that really make me interesting in a way. I think for the most part, I'm just a fairly average person who didn't have any kind of special superpowers or anything growing up and I can't really say I knew anything I never knew an author I didn't know anything about how to publish a book and you know I'm a best-selling author so that's kind of fun I, I couldn't couldn't tell you that I planned it that way um, without lying to you but you know that that that's a neat uh, a neat probably uh, interesting talking point I would imagine Oh, yeah, that's definitely one that uh, I'll ask a lot of questions on because <laughs> I also wrote a book and it was not a bestseller. So, yeah. So you wrote a book called... Yeah. Uh, I, Writing a sorry. book is definitely... It's it's definitely... Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, it's uh, it's definitely interesting, at least for me. And it, this, this is ironic being, uh, you know, kind of an improv sketch comedy uh podcast the book's got uh some improvisational theory and the importance of it but to be honest with you no one really talks about this out loud but the way at least i i wrote my book was i have kind of no clue what i was doing and i just kind of kept going with it and opportunistically <laughs> i improvised my way when the opportunities came and then i got an editor because i don't know so i researched that and, and got a publisher and you, then all of a sudden you're done this book and it's this petrifying moment where you're like, uh Oh, I need to make this official and I can't take it back and change it. And then, then, then reality of life hits you in and you're sitting there thinking, is anyone, how does anyone know about this book? Do I have to market this book? How does this work? And, uh, 
yeah so it's it's it was uh it was a crazy journey all the way through and i don't think I, at least i didn't have the the sequential plan for it there was a heavy component of improvisation i guess we'll go we'll go with that's pretty cool the book is called surfing rogue waves and um how would you describe the book uh to somebody who had never heard of the book before yeah absolutely so it's not a technical book by any means it's not a technical read it's really addresses the rapid pace of disruption we're facing in our everyday lives humanity as a whole but if you bring that all the way down to us the individual right we didn't vote for things like the internet or braces but here they are so we have all this change happening and we tend to have this inability to notice change while it's happening we just notice it after it happens and yeah, I'm very positive on it. I think we'll solve incredible opportunities in these next kind of decades coming. But this exponential change is very different than the previous change we had, right? When you're getting into material sciences and nanotechnology and this robust pipeline of biotech and blockchain and AI, we are going to be changing everything we know about our lives, our worlds, ourselves as humans. And the book kind of paints a higher picture, not so much of the peak performance individual, but more a framework, a surfing framework, ironically, surfing rogue waves, um, on how to navigate a lot of this onslaught of complexity and change and how, when you understand this, you can project and see further into the future. Because we understand these exponential trajectories of a lot of these technologies and megatrends, and we also understand complexity sciences and how we can't control it, which drives us nuts, but we can shape it in the right direction. So it's very much for that, for the individual, whether you're the CEO of your life, or the CEO of a company, the, 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 bound, the, the boundaries are very blurry now between you know life and business, and we're very much moving kind of all at once at the same pace. And without this framework it, it can be very overwhelming yeah, information fake news everything's an overload right now and if you don't have that kind of higher level mindset to pull you out of it it, it can come across as a lot and it, it's we were taught a lot of things in life that are counterintuitive but we should be doing more of now i you know if you told at least you and me growing up if we just winged it that was a big no-no and improvisation is not just winging it it's very much an art and a science but that's a lot more of what we need because we can't accurately predict the change we know the change is coming we don't know when it's coming in what order and that drives us nuts obviously but we're seeing these trends and as these trends augment each other and amplify each other we get the emergence of rogue waves so we have these different waves of complexity coming in and every now and then they all collide at the same point and there's this emergence of this violent rogue wave it feels like that's kind of what the book's about paralleling with life of course and we've never experienced the level of complexity and disruption that we're about to face like we have never come close I mean, the closest thing would be like the internet and watching as lawmakers tried to fumble their way through, um, making sure things were uh, as best they could be because right. like, there were so many different things that were out there that were brand new. Um, I mean, you mentioned blockchain. Like, I, I still, like, I have investment in blockchain. I still have no clue. <laughs> what it actually does, how it's actually going to affect me on a day to day basis. Like, these are the things, these are questions, and I, I, I can't be the only one, right? Like, everybody's got these questions, Absolutely. but it's almost like that meme. If you've ever seen the meme of Chris Pat Pratt, and he's like, I, I don't know about blockchain, but at this point, I'm afraid to ask, or I don't right, know right. about AI, <laughs> but at this point, I'm afraid to ask. Like, I think the book unpacks a lot of that, and those are great questions you pose. And there are bigger elements to a lot of these questions as well, which see um, as we look into the future there a little bit, right? So these these mega trends, blockchain, and the obvious ones are cryptocurrency, right? We watch that, but but blockchain is going to do a lot more than that. You touched on one of them, for example, when we have you know in irreversible ledgers with complete anonymity, that's not the word I'm looking for, but you know what I mean, so you're, you're following along with it. Um, we, we, we have entire industries that change, right? Insurance industries, but lawyers, for example, we have smart contracts. You and me can make, make, make you, I can buy my home from you and this smart contract layered with some AI on top of the blockchain executes everything for us. You and me don't have to do anything. Our AIs can essentially just talk and it's a secure, safe transaction. Well, now all of a sudden, what happens to you know, entire, entire mortgage industries, right? So there's, but we're seeing that kind of across. And when you have 
these ro- we have when I say robust pipeline, I just mean if this mega trend doesn't hit another one white, and that might sound very vague from a high level, but we might be off. The blockchain one might be 15 years out and not five years out, but five years out might be CRISPR, right? right. Or it could it could be something else that you know all of a sudden we have real time monitoring and we understand nano and biotechnology better and material sciences is really advanced so we can track ourselves in real time so doctors suddenly don't need to waste time checking up on healthy people they can take care of sick people because I'm being monitored through data in real time through an AI that flags anything we live longer we kill a lot of diseases we have autonomous cars suddenly there's less car accidents well there's big problems there because like to your point entire legal departments sadly depend on a car accident that there there is there is an entire industry when i say industry i mean not like a couple hundred people working i mean like billions of dollars built around right. that. suddenly our hospitals aren't as full what happens our healthcare system collapses like there are there are massive disruptions that are so interconnected that we can't really decouple them and break them off and make to your point the bet on one and we don't know exactly which will hit in what order and the book really helps paint a little bit of that picture. We don't need to be a specialist and explain all of them. We just need to have an understanding of what's coming. So when we see them start to form, when we see these waves starting to collide and a rogue wave's coming, we can position ourselves in the best position, right? And no other time in our lives, kind of like you mentioned, um, will our decisions be so important. As small as they might be, they're, they're, they are ultimately going to shape, you know, no matter the size. The fate of humanity and that sounds all encompassing and over the top but you know we can't really fight these waves of advancements and progressions but we can use them to our advantage right and and it's it's yeah. kind of riding surf where we find ourselves in a future state that's better all around for everyone more successful for you however you define it maybe more family time you know maybe getting closer with loved ones or maybe making more money whatever it is there are internet size opportunities in all of these mega trends and they will appear one day as the internet and there are certain people who were riding that wave pretty hard pretty early if you look at maybe amazon and a few of these other ones and i'd say they're doing pretty well right now so they're not all you know it's not all you got to be a bezo here but you we have all these small interconnected realistically individuals even in business make upwards of 90 percent of their decisions are are ad hoc improvisational in a way right so we have all these small interconnected improvisational complexity that we have in our life in our everyday life how we manage our we'd love to all well we wouldn't i would we'd all a lot of people would love to just philosophize right about ai and all these future mega trends we have jobs right we have bills to pay and milk to put in the fridge and all this this fun stuff so the book kind of gives a a really a 30,000 foot view and and in some of the ethical conversations we need to be having you me a- anyone needs as soon as you say ai my wife's a great example she's in healthcare she just rolls her eyes and she's like great robots and we're all going to die shut up um, <laughs> but, but but really there's ethical questions here right how like mm-hmm. you know we can't is, is it wrong to deceive people with ai when they're not aware most people would say yes and then it's like if we're taking care of an aging baby boomer generation and we understand that you know it is deceitful but it's okay because it actually releases Right, the right serotonins and dopamines that actually make them happier through the end of their life. Well, suddenly we're okay with that, but now we're deciding what's okay and not okay, and what you and me think here, or maybe in the West culture as a whole, might be different than other cultures. So we have these these trends that we can't manage in the way we've managed a lot of these problems in the past. Right, we can't we can't have our own do our own thing in this country. You know, it's something in another country. Rogue waves are good and bad. A great example is one we're fighting through right now. COVID, for example blindsided us we weren't ready for it a clear example of how different parts of a single country never mind a world to handle kind of these global problems yeah i well you know it's uh, it's funny you mentioned uh, the ai and so it's the people's perception of ai is very uh, interesting. It's right. it's very interesting, and um and, and you brought up a very good example of the older generation. Maybe because as you get older, like you have less people in your life, and so I bought my parents an Alexa, right? And my mom would actually have small conversations with. Right. Alexa and have a little bit of joy. And then she could talk to me about it. And it's like, Oh, she didn't even realize she was participating in the whole AI thing that she thought was scary and uh, all right. of that type of thing. And it is, it's, 
it's it's one of those technologies it's one of those things that we've developed that we'll probably not even realize is being implemented it just starts to happen and like the refrigerator knows that you're down on milk and gives the suggestion to grab milk who's going to dislike that the the refrigerator is basically manipulating you yeah. to giving it as a job but that's not a that's not a negative it's a positive um and, and so you probably run into a lot of those like arguments against newer technologies or because people like to argue against them i don't really understand them but they do and i think our culture is a very shock and awe culture as well. AI has been, you know, bastardized by Hollywood. When AI is going to be a problem, it's not going to be evil T-1000 and Terminator. Why would, no. why would an AI take on all of our inferior evolutionary biological problems, right? It would be a cloud-based thing that could just do whatever it wanted and it could repurpose our atoms or some nanotechnology for whatever it wanted. It doesn't right. even have to hate us in general. Um, no. But the book doesn't get in to that as much because that's getting you know a bit more like 30 to 50 years out we're, we're philosophizing at that point we're well ray guessing. kurzweil said like 30 years he was, yeah, he was very specific has been scarily accurate on something mm-hmm. like 80 percent plus yeah. of his um <laughs> yeah so something's coming uh you know and his singularity is another one but this is even before that to your point there are a lot of people who are like well put a pin in it we should stop ai but you can't stop AI because there's so many other things going in. When you explain to your point, if you took someone, you know, from 30 years ago, right, 50 years ago, 30 years ago, you mentioned we're going through so much more change now. We're experiencing 100 years of disruption every few years right now. So how's that for context, right? If you took someone from 50 years ago and you said, so check this out, we're going to give you this little metal and device and it's going to have access to all of the knowledge of humanity you can talk to it in real time it'll give you back the information it tracks every single thing you do people would be like you're you're crazy like you've beyond lost your mind right well we have that those are our cell phones like it's 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 already there so when people think ai they they think this self they think agi or asi or artificial general intelligence or these like super forms of hollywood movies where somehow this super form of intelligence goes head to head with us and then we outsmart it at the end because that's how it's going to end i mean when, nope. when yeah when, <laughs> when when you understand exponentials and you look at like what happens after an exponential curve hits artificial general intelligence that would be like you and me and an ant and again we don't hate ants we don't care about ants but we also just step on ants if they're in our way we're not we're not out to get them but right. you know if they're we might keep we might raid them if they're in our house but there's no way ants are going to predict the future of humanity that that makes no sense that would be the equivalent of us trying to you know outsmart the the the, the new asi if we ever got to some kind of um artificial super right what what are the um steps we need to worry about to get to that do you do you um do you have a good understanding of like what are the technological steps we would need to get to uh, now we're subserved? We will make great pets, as Perry Farrell said many, many <laughs> years ago. I think I think when you layer on some of the other technologies and in, 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 in material sciences and, and the biology and the science with the AI and all these things, we are going to remove incredible things. Sickle cell, you name it, all these pieces. It's good. It'll be it'll be incredible. We have this inability to draw the line between upgrading humans and fixing humans. So in the yep. past, if you humans, and we've invented lots of great things, but with CRISPR, we will fix incredible technologies. And at the same time, <laughs> we're also going to be able to do blue eyes, blonde hair, six foot eight, super athlete, super smart. Who draws the line on when it's okay to be using some of these technologies? So the, the one of the first steps is we need to be having more, honestly, more conversations about these technologies because they are not technical debates. When I, and I in a book, I unpack a little bit of just the AI ones in a very real world sense where you can say, I'm not into AI, I'm going off the grid. But unless you're throwing your car out and your credit cards, those days have passed, right? If you walk down right. the sidewalk, someone's ring camera has facially profiled 
and understands all the data points of where you were exactly when and what day. That's right. You has, putting down that you're not going to take the, the COVID shot because you don't want anybody tracking you when you're doing it on your cell phone on Facebook makes no sense. Right. And I mean, you know, <laughs> a lot of us have like social no, we, we're, we're giving we're given numbers that they literally track us for that we pay taxes on. Like this is not anything new, you know. Uh, no. So, but the but who has the rights to that data and what can they do with that data? Who owns your data ultimately? If I asked you that or anyone that, the people don't know, right? We don't we don't have the answers to who owns that data, what they can do with that data. We have different countries doing different things, and when you look into like the deep convoluted neural networks are some of the major advancements right now in AI. And some people are trying to figure out to very much mirror our human brains, but the way it develops through multiple layers is it has all these little weights that it constantly adjusts on the information you put in and it eventually gets you the, the answer. And that's where you kind of hear this black box and you don't have to get into that kind of mess. But, um, you know, depending on the information you put in on it's, it's irrelevant to who designed or build the algorithm that, can build in cultural, you know, problems and biases that might be, you know, norms we don't want that we've moved on from, believe it or not, not that long ago. And when I talk on a, you know, like a a humanity scale, you know, thousand, when you look back thousands of years and hundreds of years ago, there was one point when everyone was like, yeah, slavery is okay. And now we're like, slavery is not okay anymore. It's appalling now. Yeah. Yeah. So if we build in our current ethics, and tell that to something that's going to exponentially expand into the future, we might have a lot of ethics right now. We're not right. Forcing kids batch processing kids to go to school eight to three every day might seem like barbaric to a, you know, a more intelligent version of ourselves. When right. We could have been using right. Cognitive computing and stimulating their minds and getting them excited where they think they're playing games, but they're learning. We have all that technology now. And these are these ripe kind of shifts that we're seeing starting to build. And they're going to, absolutely destroy industries Ed- education is a ripe one for disruption i think good or bad again we we ch- chatted quick about covid that's a bad one for sure but we have been talking in industries forever about this digital transformation so covid comes around and it kind of forces the hands and now all of a sudden companies are forced to work from home they all haven't all done well and not all jobs work out to work from home either i'm not saying there's not lots of, of sadness and unnecessary you know job loss but for the most part industry's done fairly well if you take yeah. if you, if you take academics well, they they just they never cared about digital transformation. They ignored all the waves that were coming, and this rogue wave showed up, and now they're like, uh, take an eight-year-old and stick him in front of Zoom for eight hours. Like, what are you talking about? I can't even Bananas, do that Bananas, right? Now, right? Like, right? That, that, how did we ever think that was going to be effective? Yeah, just a complete you know, failure. And that just shows the difference between a mindset where you know a lot of industry was looking and ready for this digital transformation and academics were like well we've never changed in 100 years so why would we change now well that's right. why i have changed now because that's how rogue disruption works it doesn't care if you're not disrupting yourself you're dying nowadays no it's no way very true very true you mentioned amazon is a good company that has and a lot of industries have really done a very good job of adapting um uh, what what are the keys? Like, what do you, what do you need to have in order to be good at adapting to this stuff? And you obviously improv, like being able to <laughs> somehow foresee into the future and be able to come up with the proper line for everything. But uh, um, like, what what do you think are the things? Yeah, I would unpack really quickly what I call the surfing framework, which is just to help us kind of view and. Um, you know, I'll give you like the cheat sheet version. So there's a lot mm-hmm. more, obviously, to unpack. And, well, there's and probably you, more than a couple pages to the book. Yeah, right. Yeah, it took me like 360 <laughs> to get through it. But um, the serving framework really identifies a, a <clears throat> complexity that we look for in our lives. So surfing can be broken down into three things, right? Um, a surfer, waves, and a surfboard. So if we think of waves, that's the ocean. That's the world of complexity. That's our lives. It's always changing, right? It's moving. What makes a good surfer? Not the fact that they can do real-time computational physics and understand lunar and tidal patterns and know exactly where. They just surf, right? It takes practice, general understanding. So that's a bit of the model. So we've got waves. 
we understand this through some, our, our environment through complexity sciences. We look at a specific part of complexity sciences, which I equate to like the barrel of a wave. The ultimate move mm -hmm. in surfing is to get in the barrel of the wave. But sure. it's very it's very counterintuitive because the barrel of the wave is equally frightening and exciting. It's, it's where you become way better and it's such a rush and it's so exciting and you become a better surfer, but it also chews you up and spits you out every now and then when you fall. So if we live the way we're always brought up, move things back to the control in your life, right? Don't, don't, don't be in those uncomfortable spaces. You don't want to go full extreme, obviously full rogue, that's chaos. That's an entirely different kind of framework. Um, but you don't want to stay in control either. You want to push for these certain points of pressure in, in life and in systems. And not all pressure is good. Some of it's toxic and you want to get out of there. But we need to embrace that uncomfort a lot more and give up and being okay, not being in control. So we've got the wave, the surfer, is us we improvise and so how do we stay in a barrel ultimately we make the decisions right they're almost instinctive um but we've got to kind of understand that but the third part is your surfboard this is your rational foundation you need to stand on you can't surf on your feet you need a surfboard well in life you can't just improvise on wrong things right you need to improvise on rational things that map back to the reality of the world right and right now we're seeing a whole ton of misinformation a lot of people who have trouble kind of unpacking and falling into their biases and their old beliefs and if you improvise off that and it's not accurate right it doesn't matter you're it's it, you're it's irrelevant right you're, you're not improvising in the right part of the wave so really there's there's i kind of if i really dumbed it down it's it's three steps right you want to look for these barrels these 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 points of pressure in your life we, we identify this specific pressure within certain adaptive systems and complexity sciences as the need for new and novel solutions so when you're in a situation and that's happening it's there right new partnerships or relationships right suddenly you're you're talking to this alexa person in your life um healthy conflicting perspectives we shy away from that again not unhealthy and toxic perspectives, right. but it's okay to challenge each other. It's it's not a dogmatic extreme one side or the other like we're seeing. We should have lots of overlap. We should have healthy conflicting perspectives, right? And there are situations when there's an interdependence that's, you know, you're forced to kind of work together as your only kind of means of success. And that's uncomfortable. But again, those are good pressures we should look for. And as the surfer, this won't be anything new to you. you you'll know it better than myself and anyone else. But for those listening, the improvisational part is an art and a science very much, right? So the importance of spontaneity and, and going with what feels like your gut sometimes, right? Or, or you know, the, tr the, the classic yes and, but always be accepting to ideas. Don't shoot them down. Like accept, you can counter, you can do a lot of things, you can build off of them, but always be listening is a really big one. We all think we're great listeners. We're not, we're terrible. Uh, and, and to leverage those around us. So you, complexity works very much like that. A team's always stronger than an individual. So... That's step two. Step three is is the surfboard, the rational foundation. And here we have to we have to we have to work. And this is the hardest part because it forces us to look inwards at ourselves. We're not proving this to anyone other than ourselves, but we've got to be aware of our cognitive biases. We gotta to work to notice these biases. We gotta be aware of our rational beliefs, right? Understand fake beliefs and belief errors and challenge things that maybe we were just always told was right, but we never really thought to think about why they were right. Um in the book, I, I think I call her Aunt Karen, but you know, being open to letting facts change your mind. I, I think that's a big right. one, right? We get very much, it, it's it's one thing if you're cheering for your sports team, I'm irrational because I've cheered for the same sports team my whole life. I'll tell you they're gonna win every year and they're not, uh, nope. but yeah. But life's not like that, right? We have to be open to letting facts change our mind. And you know, I think remembering the strengths and weaknesses as we go through all this is machines in humans and machines, I mean, AI and all these technologies and everything it's machines and humans are stronger together than either will ever be alone currently in our foreseeable future. So we're not at a point where either is replacing and, you know, seeing those opportunities and thinking how we best leverage both of those. Cause the reality is when we're moving into new unknown waters, there's no data for that. But when it comes to predicting stuff, we have unfortunately been slaughtered by algorithms in AI and they can predict things a lot better than us when they have the right data points. So it's, it's very much a balance of those three elements, you know, the three kind of pillars of that surfing framework that when you understand that and we go through some examples and the first half of the book is a little bit more foundational building this and the back half gets really fun and you kind of surfs up. We, we get in all kinds of fun situations and it helps you kind of see it. And when you think like that, you start to view the world a little bit differently, your interactions a little bit differently and you might not feel it in the moment, much like you don't really notice, you know, 
friction coefficients in water in your surfboard when you're surfing, but you're surfing, right? And the last part is it's got to be pragmatic. You got to get, you can know, you can be the most knowledgeable surfer physicist in theory in the world, unless you get out there and surf and take some wipeouts, like you're never going to do it. So we're going to, we're going to screw up. We're going to fall. That's okay. Like we've got to just, it's better to do something and fail than, than nothing right now at the end of the day. Yeah, action is definitely the most important thing you're going to do in any given day. If you're not doing anything, you can, yeah, you, I mean, it would be neat if we could all be academics and think about all of that stuff. And But someone's got to go out there and make that change happen. For sure. So you've got the hair for it. I'm guessing you uh, surf? I'm, <laughs> I am a terrible surfer. Are uh, you? Well, at I least do. you went out and tried. Yeah. I, oh, yeah. I try. I'm that, I'm that idiot for sure. I, you know, for me, I probably get up for what feels like four minutes and it's probably 12 seconds. And mm-hmm. it probably feels like a, an awesome 12-foot barrel and it's probably a four-foot wave. But um, I, I, I grew up kind of landlocked in Canada, right? Never got surfed too much. But, you know, did much of the wakeboarding and snowboarding and all that stuff. And I had some opportunities to spend a lot of time in Australia and the, in the West Coast of the U.S. And I just kind of jumped in the water every chance I could. Again, not because I was any good, but I was never big and I, sh- I should have been and I just wasn't. But I was never big, you know, into yoga and a lot of the stuff. And I found surfing had this really perfect mix for me you're sitting out there and you're the water is almost flat and you're waiting for sets and it's so you know bliss and tranquil and calming and then all of a sudden it builds kind of like life right and then all of a sudden you're getting dialed in and you're locked in and you went from this like incredible zen calm to like so intense because for me i'm just trying to paddle so i don't die and get chewed up by this wave but you know you're like everything every decision you make everything is like again you're improvising it but everything matters right shifting your body weight your arms how fast you're going what you're looking at where you're going it's it's this amazing you know and then you go there you ride it for a bit you didn't at least i do i end up getting spit out and chewed up by the end and you know spit some nose out spit some water out my nose get back at it but like that 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 amazing mix is very much like why it parallels i feel so much to life so i i i uh I'm definitely not a good surfer, but I, I love to get in the water any chance I get. Yeah, you know, I've uh, I lived on the ocean. I've never been surfing. Oh. Maybe just convinced me I need to go try. Yeah, you're up. You're up. Are you in Portland? Uh, no, I'm in Denver. I'm landlocked now. Oh, I'm in okay. Denver now. But yeah, I was in Portland. But I I uh, graduated high school in Santa Cruz. I had friends that oh. surfed. I had friends that surfed that would go. Hey, I've got an extra everything. Like let's go. And I just never did it yeah you guys should call those people and see you know what else (laughs) you know what else is great about it to be honest with you all up and down there you can you can go get a little you know rent a board for the day or for a half a day and go on your own and you know you kind of figure it out on your own a little bit but it's just so especially nowadays we are so so inundated with screens is the word i'm going to use but you know it's your phone it's this you're on the computer you're so connected when you're surfing, there, there's nothing else you can do. You, you're there. You're, you're present in the moment with your thoughts. And I think that more than ever is and, – and everyone's surfing, as we're going to call it, is different. It could be snowboarding or hiking or reading a book or writing music. I don't know. But whatever you're surfing is, it's really important more than ever now with this kind of overload and stimulus, I feel, that we, we kind of find our, our, our places to surf because – it's it's a it's a cleanse right it's it's like a reset almost where we're just so connected all the time especially now stuff's moved right work from home people are like that's the last thing they look at is their screen when they put down it's the first thing they look at when they wake up and they're literally on it the entire day it's it's It's, uh that's a hundred percent true i i i do it too i can't say we're all guilty i know i know so i think those 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 little if you can find those little you know spots in life to get away it helps for sure yeah well i uh, honestly i could talk about this all day uh i, I am a <laughs> i've read everything that um curse Wilde's written and i uh, your book is fascinating to me uh but we do have to record a sketch Eric, I know my mind was blown during that. I'm pretty sure a lot of listeners were too. 
do me a favor. I, your book covers so much more. Please tell them where they can find more about you and more about surfing rogue waves. Yeah, I can be found at ericpb.me, E-R-I-C-P-B dot M-E. And the book's there as well as this podcast and some other information on, on some of the other initiatives I have going on. And on all of the social handles, uh, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and, and LinkedIn, of course, which are all a slash at Eric PB dot me version of whatever the handles are nowadays they're calling them and now our sketch law and order btc in three two in the criminal justice system technology-based offenses are considered confusing and are largely swept under the rug in new york city the overpaid detectives and lawyers involved with these felonies are kept employed because no one else wants to deal with them these are their stories I'm telling you, your client absolutely committed this murder. Look, Your Honor, I'm not really sure what he's talking about. I've been practicing law for 30 years, and there is zero evidence of any kind that can point anything to my client being even remotely close to the area in which this murder took place. That is untrue. We have eyewitnesses that that man over there is guilty of murder. Well, that man over there is actually a woman. Well, I do declare, I believe we will be able to prove this without an uncertain doubt that your client, be it man or woman, or she, maybe she should wear longer hair. Well, either way, we will make sure that that person is is declared guilty of this murder. Well, I look forward to understanding that because I can pretty much confidently refute all of the evidence that is going to be coming this way. Well, how are you going to refute all of the evidence? For starters, there's a encrypted ledger that can't be changed in any way. And if we look at that, I feel like we can pretty much answer most of our questions right there. Oh, hold on a second. Let me see that. I rest my case. Yeah, there's no way this person could have committed this murder. Thank you for joining us for Sketch Comedy Podcast Show. 100% not produced by AI. I promise you, it was a lot of hours on my behalf. Uh, just real quick, I got to give you this legalese so that it protects me and protects you. Sketch Comedy Podcast Show is protected under Creative Commons Attribution No Derivatives 4.0 International License. What that means is if you would like to reproduce anything from the show, please contact the show at sketchcomedypodcastshow.com and let's talk and let's get you a really good, solid copy of whatever it is you want to reproduce. Uh, until next time, go out there and create a comedy adventure of your own. And uh, just make sure that uh, uh, it's real, I guess. Oh, well, well, maybe we'll figure out how to do social media uh, at some point. It'll, right. it'll evolve somehow. There'll be a new Eric, one. We'll just wirelessly do social media. Yeah. Do, 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 do. yeah. I love it. <laughs>